Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here on a Sunday with two of my favorite humans, two of my best girlfriends, Nadia Narain, who is basically one of the UK's most beloved, I think, and well-known yoga teachers, even though she would deign to differ. (laughs) She's here in New York for the launch of her second book, Rituals for Every Day. Her first book is called Self-Care for the Real World. It is, both of them, very well-loved and I feel very important. She's brought a conversation that's usually had, you know, between people and behind sort of closed doors and in classes and in sessions. She's brought that conversation to the forefront, which I think is a very important act. So thank you for that. And I look forward to our evening together. Thank you. Katya wishes she was here too. Katya's sister, co-author. And Ali Bogart is here, back by popular demand. Thanks for having us such a treat i want to be here every day every day especially if we get breakfast cooked for us like yes <laughs> james cooked breakfast i can't take credit i did produce it but i didn't cook it um i'd love to start today with a reading from the one of the book that accompanies the hilma off clint show at the guggenheim it's called notes and methods this particular reading is on page 29 of this beautiful book worth your um, shekels if you love hilma This is from four loose sheets that were found slipped into the notebook of the five, the five capital T capital F group of five women, including Hilma, who would channel, believe it or not. It's from September 16th, 1903. My birthday. It is your birthday. Not 1903, but September 16th. (laughs) (laughs) Even though sometimes we feel like we were born in 1903. We have 70 years on this. You are bewildered by what we have told you, but the phenomenon we are trying to explain is truly bewildering. What is this phenomenon, you ask? Well, beloved, it is that which we want to call the secret growing. How often have we heard you say that everything is futile, nothing comes of all your labors, and yet like amorphous buds, your endeavors sprout in all directions. You see everything is formless and you forget that this is a sign of life. Gradually the formlessness takes on more precise contours and the steadily growing roots feed an ever stronger plant, which will one day explode with an abundance of leaves and flowers. You know this is so, but you must perceive this knowledge with such vividness that you dare to build on it. You have to feel with certainty that even the smallest effort to grow in goodness leaves a clear trace inside you. And when you do not see an outer result, this must not discourage or tire you in your efforts. For just as invisible hands help and tend every plant on this green earth, so every budding sprout of goodness is tended and shaped and protected by invisible powers. And when the time comes, your eyes will open and you too will see the beautiful plant that grew in secrecy. The product of your noble endeavors and your pure intentions. Accept our account as a greeting from us so that you shall never tire when all seems lost. I like hearing from the other side. (laughs) And I think that it's a really nice sort of jumping off point for our conversation because so much of what we build our teaching, all three of us, and so much of what we build our friendship on is this, this trust in the fact that messages from the other side, from other dimensions, dare I say, and I mean this lumpishly and factually, I don't mean this poetically and woo woo. 
that these messages are reaching us all the time were we to listen. And it is what causes and helps us trust in the process of growing. So I thought, you know, not just for the other yoga teachers out there, even though there are so many and it, it could be helpful for them, but for all the humans, the women, the men who love them, uh, the women who love them, you know, to talk about what it means to grow and to trust that the other side is actually rooting for us and helping us along. It feels like a good topic. It's a great topic. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I talk to my dad more now that he's on the other side right. than I ever did when he was here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Certainly ask him for a lot more help. Yeah. I think I feel that way about my mom too, mm. for sure. But don't you feel that when you were a younger teacher that you always felt like you had to make these notes and read these books and try and get the words out? Yes. And then as you get older and you get more quiet, it just kind of comes through you, but you don't understand that when you're newer and younger at it. And sometimes I shock myself and mm. I'm like, oh, where did that come from? That I was good. That. that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what it was, but it was good. <laughs> it's in the hard drive. Mm. Yeah, that's nice, actually. For those of you, you know, if you're a younger teacher, let's say, and you're just coming up and you're, you know, teaching five to 20 classes a week, bless your heart. Just know that you can, of course, continue studying and of course, continue taking notes and of course, continue building your repertoire of what you understand, but also continue to build your trust in the fact that you're being guided. Mm -hmm. All the information is coming through you when you're actually practicing rather than always taking notes mm. to try and get the words down or the right move down. Mm -hmm. Do you that's, know what I mean? Yeah, that's really nice. I had to learn that a long, a long yeah. way. I would so often stop practicing and take, I still do, stop mm. practicing, take a note. You know, I don't want to forget this. You never really this. look back at the note, but you kind of remember the experience. In your body. In your cells, yeah. It's a recording. Mm. But hand in hand with this concept of the other side and listening to guidance that that helps us, we have to have the conversation that it is us. So it's another voice inside or a place inside that is speaking to us as us. Mm. Like it helps me not to think of the other benevolent realms as other. But in fact, a part of you. Yeah. Part and of us. There's a befriending, like we need each other <clears throat> as we are each other. So remembering, and this is for not just for yoga teachers, but for everyone. Yeah. Remembering that you possess, what's the word? It's not possess. You kind of hold it all, don't you? You hold you it. You hold it that's all. Nice. And you have to get quiet enough to be able to hear it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what happens with our age too. Mm. We get more into our meditation practice yeah. rather than our asana practice and you get quieter. Yes. Although lately I've been doing both more. Of course you have. Only because <laughs> I think, no, only because I would lose my shit if I didn't. Yeah. I know, but the priority used to be in the physical right. much right. more than the quiet spaces, I suppose. Can't you imagine how much the other side also wants our help as well? Like we have the organs of action. We have mm. the voice and the hands and the right. feet. That if there is such benevolent realms that help and heal, they too would want our help. Mm. And how do we go about doing that? How do we go about teaching that? I think we build friendship, like the way we build relationship between the three of us, just mm. human relationship. It's the same structure format of building befriended relationships to other realms. Wow. So it's respectful and listening based and inviting and permissive and just the ways to build friendship. So learning how to be a good friend yeah so i think i'm actually to the other side i'm actually understanding a couple of things learning how to be a good friend to your friends here and choosing carefully yeah you can marie condo your friends <laughs> so, well, it, it, that makes perfect sense right do people spark joy in your life or not mm. and if they don't they gotta go and to your point earlier <laughs> I love when Nadia lays the hammer down. <laughs> to, your, to your point earlier, though, we, we've been obsessing about Marie Kondo yeah. around here. And uh, if you do have children, watch with your kids because Jonah suddenly caring deeply about his bed made mm. and how perfectly and his drawers. It's really awesome. Your point earlier, though, Nadia, was 
uh, it's not about getting rid of stuff. No, it's not true. about, to- what was the point? It's not about it's getting not about rid of getting, stuff. I heard her say, it's not about getting rid of stuff. It's about living with the things that feel good, that spark joy. Yeah. So you spend less time with the people <clears throat> that don't <clears throat> do that and more time with the people that do. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, point to highlight here. But going back to your point, Ali, I think the listening and then the trusting that you heard right instead of the constant conversation in our head that mm. tells us, mm, no, don't do that. It's getting quiet and just trusting that actually they are giving us messages all the time, but we don't always trust it. And we get better at it by being a good friend and mm. listening to our friends. This very powerful teacher one time was explaining the benevolent invisible realm or the angelic realm to me one time. Yes. And he said, imagine like you're walking through a forest and you see a little baby bird has tried to fly from its nest and it fell. And so you walk by and you take your hands and you scoop up the baby bird and you lift it up into the nest and to the bird, it thinks an absolute miracle has happened. Gravity stopped and something occurred. But to you, you just picked up a bird and put it in the nest. And just out of the want for life to continue, of course you want that bird in its nest. And he said, that's the way the angelic realm is with us. It's nothing to help. But we have to stay open to the what we would call a miracle. The bird would call us a miracle. But perhaps to the other realm, it's just easy. We don't know. So we, for example, get put in the path of somebody who can help us. We, for example, land in a situation where we meet somebody or we have an experience that feels miraculous, but really it's the angelic realm doing what's natural and we experience it as a small miracle. Or we get placed as a teacher in front of a room and you know when someone comes up to you and goes, oh my God, you just said that one thing and that's what I've been feeling like and I didn't know what those words were and we kind of didn't ever even think that that was an angelic realm moving through us. Right. So you get to do it all the time. Just say that one thing if you get quiet enough. Yes. To move someone or help someone or guide someone in some way. It's not us. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah, the desire to help and how good it feels to help is such human virtue. Mm. Like, mm. how many people you help in a week, Alina? It's and you, and you. All of us. You're prolific. And it's such a beautiful exchange. How, why, why would other realms not want to be right here with us for us. We're just so small-minded. Assignment, if you're listening. Ask for help. Not only ask for help, the assignment has, I think, three arms. A, can we go A, B, three? Yeah. Or one, two, C? Yeah. A, (laughs) ask for help. (laughs) I know you like it when I do that. I love numbered lists. Um, A, ask for help. Make a note, seriously, if you're listening, write it down. Say, ask for help, the first thing. The second thing is, be a good friend. Do something, go go out of your way to listen or to uh, trust, mm-hmm. as Nadia said. And then C, third, there was something in Rituals for Every Day that knocked me over, knocked my socks off. Carry around, knocked my socks off, no pun intended. Carry, on carry around pair socks. a pair of warm socks in the wintertime. Yeah. And in case you come across somebody who's cold, you can give them a pair of socks. I got tears. Just straight up tears. Picturing you. Here's what I picture. <laughs> you in your fucking long coat, you know, <laughs> walking through the streets of Primrose Hill, <laughs> seeing the homeless guy with your four bags and your food bags and everything and your big, you know, homeless chic look. <laughs> And your high top converse. See, they see me coming. They're like, oh, she's one of us. <laughs> totally. No, no, I'm not even, I mean, yes, it's funny, but it's not even funny how you will walk up to somebody and give them a pair of socks. I did give warm. someone one of my feather down pillows the other day because oh, he really needed it. And I had an extra one anyway. I gave it to him. And the sweetest thing was that he held it to him and he smelt it. Oh. And he just inhaled it and he went, oh. This smells so good. I'm oh. going to sleep so sweetly tonight. Nice. And I just realized that 
you know, I live in this house with aromatherapy oils and everything smells clean and fresh and we take all of that for granted. Yes. And there was this man that just was like so happy to have a pillow that smelt fresh. What if the other realm is just purely us? Like that's such good, kind, benevolent help that he would never expect to receive in a day. Mm. He's the bird. Yeah. You're the angel. It's so beautiful. But it's easy to do, isn't it? And we always wonder what we can do and yep. we never know what to do. And that's always an easy thing to do. I think there's another branch to that homework of feeling like receiving help is not you being a burden or is not, I'll often feel like mm. I don't want to burden people with what I need help with. And so really feeling mm. deserving of help. That Remembering yeah. that you're not a burden. Yeah. That helping is a beautiful relationship of exchange. We get so much from it when rising tides lift all boats. There's also, yeah. back to our book. No, no, I want to <laughs> I'm only joking, but, no, but I actually there was something else in the book that was just, we talked about, actually came from the actress Olivia Coleman from The Favourite that just won her Oscar and all the awards for being a great actress. But she was overheard in a line at the post office actually. And it was something, she said something about every day she tries to do something nice for someone else. So if you set that to be your intention each day, that's almost guidance from someone else too. How can you serve? What could you do to make someone's day a little bit sweeter? This was so not where we expected to go, but I, I love this talk. <laughs> no, you know what though? It's exactly how we talk when we're sitting around it's in a true. steam room somewhere. But you not? said something funny on the last podcast, Ali, because you said it is so rare that we get to sit around and just chat because yeah. we're all so busy and, even and distracted though, and distracted, <laughs> <laughs> very distracted. And this is lovely. It's great, right? It's so even best. if it doesn't go on air, I'm just going to listen to it over and over again. <laughs> no, no, it's going to go on. It's going to be great. And, you know, my my intent with every single one of these things is just that we may reach one person mm -hmm. and help them have a better day mm. just being themselves mm. back to rituals for every day what's the first thing you think of when you think of what you're proudest about this book i think what's been lovely for kati and i is that we were born in the east we mm -hmm. were born in hong kong our father was indian so we actually were raised with a lot of these rituals in our lives you know my mum always had a feng shui man that came to the house and we had to paint a wall red in the living room or put a screen somewhere or every Chinese New Year my mum goes to the temple and buys Katia and I these lucky charms that we have to she'd like us to wear them in our bra but we just keep them in our wallet and she really really believes in those things and um, our dad used to have Ganesh's all over the house that he paid tribute to so we were raised on all of this, this this stuff and we'd forgotten how much a part of us it was right and then when we started putting all this stuff down in the books we realized that there was so much depth and richness and ritual in our lives in your merest life experience mm. as kids dad was from india you mentioned that yes yeah yeah and we were born in hong kong and then katia married a jewish man mm -hmm. so she got a bit of that thrown in as well right and I think when you have children too, you want to be able to pass things down to them. And she has two kids. Yeah, two. Kids are being raised Jewish? Yes. Nice. Yes, but then she feels like it's really important to make sure they know the Indian and the Chinese For and the, sure. all the other stuff as well. For sure. Mm. That's actually really sweet. And the most ritual people do is usually superstition, trying mm. to ward off the bad. Yeah. Rather than rituals to habitualize the special or invoke the good mm. or even to move through the hard right you know so there are rituals that you could do when you've broken up with a loved one or if a parent has died that could really mark that time for you to move through which is quite beautiful mm -hmm. talk to us about rituals for a breakup that's a really nice thing to hmm well I've been through quite a few of those <laughs> <laughs> we all have <laughs> We all have. I have my ideas of what the rituals were that worked for me. I mean, I think the letting go ritual was always a big one where you sort of cut the ties between you and the other person, but not in a negative way, just to almost take back the parts of yourself that maybe they kept 
and to give them the parts of themselves that you've kept Mm. and to understand that there's a reason why it's not working anymore. Mm. So if you can gently just cut the energetic ties that weren't working, you may come together again later in a different capacity. But I think we get scared sometimes because we want to hold on energetically. But it's important to let it go sweetly. Yeah. And I think that's always the thing that I try and do. That's really nice. Mm. Hard to do. And sometimes it might be just sitting and playing all the songs that you both listen to until you're sick of listening to those songs. You know, there's lots of ways to get deep into it, but I like the tie cutting. Yeah, so that the relationship isn't marked by just the last moments of pain. Mm. It Mm. encourages all of the aspects of the growth and the love and the truth that made Mm. it so. That's a great point. What's your definition of ritual that you guys are working with in the book? Well, I think how we defined it was that we wanted to make the mundane bits of life a little bit more special because I think you kind of go through life and it's all very quick and you haven't marked each morning when you wake up is a big thing, isn't it? You're alive. Miracle. And so we wanted to make the mundane special and then you want to make the special things almost magical or a big a memory in your life and um so Katia does a lot of these things with the kids and I don't know they're just important they're really important they add to the richness Mm -hmm. the tapestry of life Mm. I like the idea of just offering one way and you offer so many it's like dozens of ways to make the mundane into something a little more noticeable Mm. What are some of the everyday things that you offer in the book for people? Well, it was funny when we wrote self-care, people are like, okay, we know we have to do it, but we don't know how to do it. Mm. And so I think rituals was a bunch of recipes of this is how simple it can be. And it could be a simple, there's a beautiful one to do in the winter mornings. Mm. And we were doing them in London. And then Kati is 11, 12 year old, started doing them. (laughs) And she come downstairs and Jonah's sitting there at six o'clock in the morning with his little homework books and we just lit candles around the house in the morning so you didn't really turn any lights on but you just had this beautiful glow of candlelight on the dark mornings because it's always a bit depressing in the winter when it's dark Mm. and just little things like that are so beautiful and magical or just sitting with your cup of tea and instead of checking your phone while the kettle's boiling or the coffee's brewing, you could just sit and meditate for five minutes. That's a little ritual in itself, is just to be able to pause and set an intention for the day. Mm. One thing that I've been really impacted and touched by is how you are constantly in the ritual of making pujas and altars. Mm. (laughs) What do you do when you go to specialize something? Mm. You know, so it's a book or it's a project or it's, the apartment what do you do um just the other day so i'm like i said i'm about to do this tuesday night event with nadia and katya at abc which is the puja (laughs) altar inspiration central in my life (laughs) and abc carpet and home on the corner of 19th and broadway in new york city if you haven't seen it go to abc carpet and home online it's absolutely stunning and you are going to want to spend all your money In light of that, I took the two copies of uh, Nadia and Katya's books, both of them. I stacked them on the windowsill. James came home with this flurry of tulips. And I arranged the tulips and I placed the books in front of the tulips. And now it's like this beautiful prayer place that the Tuesday evening should go well and that I should be absorbing all the information in the books. And anytime I walk in the house, in these days, because it's happening in a few days, I'm just reminded of my service there. And I'm remembering to study a little bit and read another page and think about how I'll word things. And (laughs) Nadia just mouthed to me that she loves me. It's the greatest. (laughs) But that's all I do. If you just have one, you could buy one stem of a flower, one Mm. plant and place it near a picture of somebody that you love who's suffering. You could place it near a stone and the picture of somebody you love who has passed or somebody you love who is in your life and needs some guidance and they're not asking for it yet, but you know what they should be doing. Set up an altar. 
Yeah, it makes me think of physicalized prayer. It is. Mm. It's physicalized prayer. You have a whole section on altars. So there's we well, we teach people how to make an altar. Yes. And um my favorite ritual is actually the vision holder. So if you know that someone's going through a difficult time, that you would just sit and maybe pray for that person to move through it. You could hold a stone, you could have a little piece of jewelry that you meditate on, and then you just give it to that person. Yes. You don't have to tell them that you were sitting there meditating every day for them, mm -hmm. but you've kind of put your prayer and your wish into something that you pass on to them to help them move through it. And I think that's so beautiful because People set up altars and they don't even realize that they do, even if it's just a shelf of family pictures. That's kind of an altar in it itself. Is, for mm -hmm. sure, for sure. It's so lovely to do something for somebody like that that they'll never know about mm. cognitively, you know. Human such, angels. It's powerful. Um, I am drawn to open up uh, Tokopa Turner's book. She's, she and I have been circling around each other for a while. It's so beautiful. The book is called Belonging. Subtitle, Remembering Ourselves Home. So very apt for this. And it's literally the very first page after the TOC, the, the table of contents. For the rebels and the misfits. <gasps> we're the rebels and the misfits. We <laughs> definitely, we fancy ourselves as the rebels. We were used we to, were. We, we were. I think we're still a bit the rebel, not so much the misfits anymore. Only slightly. Sorry to interrupt. Sober. <laughs> I mean, we used to get into a fair amount of trouble <laughs> for the rebels and the misfits, the black sheep and the outsiders, for the refugees, the orphans, the scapegoats, the weirdos, the uprooted, the abandoned, the shunned and invisible ones. I want to also add to the little girls and the little boys and the little ones who are transitioning May you recognize with increasing vividness that you know what you know. May you give up your allegiances to self-doubt, meekness, and hesitation. May you be willing to be unlikable and in the process be utterly loved. May you be impervious to the wrongful projections of others and may you deliver your disagreements with precision and grace. May you see with the consummate clarity of nature moving through you that your voice is not only necessary, but desperately needed to sing us out of this muddle. May you feel shored up, supported, entwined, and reassured as you offer yourself and your gifts to this world. And may you know for certain that even as you stand by yourself, you are not alone. Nice. Yeah, very that's, appropriate. That's very appropriate mm -hmm. for right now. Um, when it comes to, Nadia, when it comes to your, uh, both of you, when it comes to your latest inspirations for your work, uh, really like in this moment, what comes to mind as what is moving your water right now? Moving my water is... Is that the same as rocking your boat? Word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Word. Rocking your boat, moving your water. Moving my water is the practice of prayer where it, to me, feels like the feminine creative side of meditation, the, the lost language mm. of prayer where we get to mm -hmm. communicate to the moment we're in. And it, it, this conversation is exactly it. The, the conversation we have with invisible benevolent forces that want for us and we want for them to know that there are really good and beautiful and magical things happening despite what gets noisy and loud. That's good. It's really good. Yeah. Um, let's see, so much at the moment. But I think I, think I have a tendency to sort of buckle down and get to work. You do have a tendency. I do. Which is what I like about you. Yeah, I'm quite a hard worker. Um, but I think I'd like to spend a little bit more time with things that just make me joyful. Mm. Without it having to be doing something or getting anywhere, like taking my pottery classes that I'm really rubbish at, but it's just fun. And there's You're no... taking pottery classes right now? Yeah, I, yeah. 
do you not go? right now this second I've got no. another course starting in a few months but I'm terrible at it but I just like the way it feels don't you love learning and, and I'm not thinking hands? I just like the process yeah and I don't think oh I'm gonna do a show or anything like that I just you know? pictured your show no I made something and I tried to give it so to my ridiculous. sister the other day and she went why don't you make me something when you get to level three <laughs> <laughs> that's something only a sister, sister could say i'll take it and okay. i'll i'll curate your show she'll turn it into a puja no i'll but also just turn little it into things a puja. like <laughs> no but you do think sometimes you it stops you especially virgos you stop yourself from doing things because you think you're not good at them and actually it's just the art of doing yeah. that's important and i'm just trying to pay attention to that a little bit more that it doesn't have to go anywhere it just has to feel nice sometimes Maybe that's another arm of this assignment mm. for this episode. Do something uh, perhaps creative, perhaps not, where you're not even dealing with the outcome. You're mm. just doing the doing of it. And pay attention to the critical voice that tells you that you're rubbish or don't bother. Although I wouldn't mind the word rubbish if my voice called me rubbish. I would <laughs> smile sweetly. Oh, you're so <laughs> bloody rubbish, Elena. <laughs> Shite. <laughs> would be worse um no what's you what about you yeah honestly what's moving me right now is this passage from Hilma bewildered like that, that we could be so bewildered by the fact that all we're doing is growing mm. can you read that part again about small acts in invisible ways yeah did I get that right for sure You see everything as formless, and you forget that this is a sign of life. Gradually, the formlessness takes on more precise contours, and the steadily growing roots feed an ever stronger plant, which will one day explode with an abundance of leaves and flowers. You know this is so, but you must perceive this knowledge with such vividness that you dare to build on it. You have to feel with certainty that even the smallest effort to grow in goodness leaves a clear trace inside you. When you do not see an outer result, this must not discourage or tire you in your efforts. For just as invisible hands help and tend every plant on this green earth, mm. so every budding sprout of goodness is tended and shaped and protected by invisible powers. And when the time comes, your eyes will open and you too will see the beautiful plant that grew in secrecy, the product of your noble endeavors and pure intentions. Do you know what it made me think of a little bit was I was thinking about probably all of us when we were first starting out For and sure. how we used to travel all across the world and study with teachers and we never really thought that we were doing it to be where we are now. We were just doing it to grow. And get better. And get. And out of love. Yeah, it was out of love and just to grow in so many ways. And then all of a sudden we arrived here. Am I a bad person if I wanted to do it to get better at my craft? I don't think you really <laughs> did at the beginning. Vanity, don't worry. <laughs> no, I don't think you really did at the beginning. I, you didn't go to Guru Mai to get better at your craft. No, you actually, went that's there very to grow. true. I went there because I was worried that my life wasn't going in the right direction and she represented something. I think to me. you thought you were doing it to get better at your craft, but you weren't really. All I know is I saw that picture and I was like, I'm going to that lady. <laughs> I'm going there. That was early. That was 2000, 1999, 2000. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Oh my God, we've known each other that long. Mm -hmm. Good. Before grief, that. Dude, we met in 1998. I just realized 90, it's 20 yeah, years. It was just before you went there. Wow. I'll never forget the first time at Nadia. Was nobody, it? It no, was at Ohm. Nobody forgets the first time at Nadia. <laughs> no. <laughs> we were at Ohm. This is a shout out to Cindy Lee. I quite an impression, do I? Cindy Lee. Yeah. On 14th Street, right? It was on 14th Street. You were wearing a white shirt. I as remember I that because I was like, oh, that's a good look, wearing a shirt as a yoga teacher and not yoga clothes. Oh, like a white button-down yeah, shirt. Yeah, like a white button-down shirt. But I was just thinking about how some of the things that we did, we were sort of guided in that direction, really. I don't think we ever planned to end up where we are now. I was guided to never wear yoga clothes for the first 15 years of my teaching career. 
You inspired a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. Not a big fan. <laughs> well, anything else that we want to touch on, either in the realm of Hilma and the witches, the good witches, or growing that seed of goodness within us, or rituals for every day, I mean, it's all kind of the same conversation, but is there anything that I'm forgetting? I would say for myself mm -hmm. and what my good counsel would be for anybody right now is mm -hmm. don't do anything alone. Don't do anything alone. Yeah. Even if it's imploring the other forces or asking a good friend, I think loneliness mm -hmm. is creeping into dangerous places mm -hmm. and it need not. There's so much support and there's so much love and that mm. to just take a friend by the hand, invisible or otherwise, past or otherwise, and not be in it alone is, I think, super important. I heard this crazy thing that by 2020, next year, the World Health Organization said the number one pressing health concern was depression, anxiety from too much isolation and loneliness. Mm. Yeah. Beyond any of the malarias or any of those is mental disorders and mental illness. And add to that, the whole conversation that uh, our friend Luke Story is having on the Lifestylist podcast, episode 191, don't miss it. What's it about? Dr. Jack Cruz is just a little crazy and just a little right. The My favorite combination. Oh, man. The 5G apocalypse. Oh, scared. Okay, so basically what's being caused is a third unnatural Van Allen belt around the earth. A stratospheric, not naturally formed belt that actually holds in all the radiation that we're emitting it's caused by the radiation and then serves to hold it in closer to us so that all of these um children that are growing up now with phones with technology are now basically getting this is so scary demyelinated oh very interesting you know, your myelin sheath is what covers your uh, synapses in your brain. It's you basically a like a, it's a buffer. It's an insulation around that synapse. If you lose or your myelin gets degraded, you can't think clearly. You can't develop correctly. You, there are so many functions that aren't going to work properly. How do you fix it? We all know it's omega-3s, it's B12, it's all the things that we do and eat to protect the body and feed the gut, feed the brain. Yeah, be in nature, forest bathe. And be in nature, exactly. And that's what Dr. Jack says. The most important thing we can do right now, along with your comment on not being alone, even if you feel like you're asking for help from the other side or from a dear friend, he also said, just make sure that you get in with the trees as mm -hmm. often as you can because they, they're feeding us. The tree hugging. I am a tree hugger. Oh, Nadia. When I you started hugging I trees, I nearly fell over. The <laughs> it's the best. Do we have time to go to the park right now, actually, and go hug some trees? We might do on the way. I don't know if we do. I'll walk you guys but out. But I'm constantly yeah. getting busted by people in the park going, Nadia, is that you? <laughs> hugging a tree? <laughs> I'm standing there. In Regent's Park? Tree. I love it. Usually it's in Hampstead Heath. Oh, okay. yeah, where the really big trees are. Don't I love it. Change. Don't ever change, please. Keep taking pictures of those and post them on your stories, please. <laughs> we need them. I need those every day, like a shot in the arm. But I think that's also where, um, you know, when we go to yoga class and we're together, mm. or we go to our spiritual practices and we're all together, that's where those um, practices really feed us, mm -hmm. phone off and mm -hmm. just being with one another. Yep. I think that's a great place to close. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. I love you, you so much, both of you. Thanks for having us. I'm thank looking you. forward to your book launch. And then, um, Ali, I know we're going to, for you, if you're listening and you're wondering, Ali and I are going to do our Q&A session, I promise. It's coming soon. And uh, we have logged your questions that you've left us in various places, and we're going to address them as and soon as possible. It's more of, it's not a question and answer. It's going to be more of a question and more questions. Right. <laughs> question and question. Yeah. Excuse me. Totally. And our best guess. Questions and our best guess. Right. Because we know nothing. 
Nothing. Nothing. Very little. Thank you, listener. We love you very much. Love you. Thank you.